Hi everyone and welcome to just this short video on commonly missed topics in unit one. So after looking at your guys' cheat sheets and um, the results of the personal progress checks, I just wanted to create this short video uh, based on the unit one of the AP curriculum, which remember is different than unit one uh, that we did. So this is unit one in the AP curriculum and this focuses on anything from uh, moles and mass to PES and periodic trends. So looking at the personal progress checks, topic 1.2 was actually the one that was missed the most, uh, but 1.3 was also one where uh, some people struggled. So I wanna talk specifically about those and then just look at some things with periodic trends to ensure that you get the most points when you're looking at the free response questions on the AP test. So topic 1.2 was mass spectrometry. So a lot of times you'll just hear me say mass spec. And mass spec, what it tells us really is how many isotopes there are in an element. So if you looked at the unit guides, you notice that it said something about mass spec not being tested. Now, the part of mass spec that is not being tested is looking at the mass spec of a mixture of elements. You will still be required to look at the mass spectrum of an individual element. So, for example, here on this screen, we have a mass spec graph that is for uh, just one element. So this tells us element X, some unknown. So a mass spectra tells us how many isotopes an element would possess. It also can help us identify the average atomic mass, which remember is a weighted average of each of the isotopes. And um, a mass spectrum can also tell us uh, the identity of an element because we can look at the um, average molar mass and then compare it to the periodic table. So how to tell that this is a mass spec problem. So if you were given a problem and you were trying to figure out, you know, how do I know it's mass spec? Well, you'll always be given a graph. And on this graph, you'll have abundance on the y-axis and you'll have either mass or mass to charge, something like that on the x-axis. So if we look at this example, we have relative abundance versus mass. And this says that the mass spectrum of element X is presented in the diagram above based on this, which of the following can be concluded about element X. So when we look at this, we can use this to identify a few different things. First, how many isotopes, and that's based on how many peaks it has. So when we're looking at how many isotopes this has, we look at the peaks. So one, two, three, four, five peaks means five isotopes. But from this graph, we also can identify that 50% 50 of this mass is gonna be somewhere around 90. Now it's not gonna be exactly 90 because we still have four peaks that have masses higher. We have four isotopes with masses higher, but it's probably gonna be pretty close to 90. And so which of the following can be concluded? So the only thing that we can conclude about this is either the number of isotopes, what the element is, or somewhere around um, the average atomic mass. So if we look at this transition metal, no, um, the peaks do not represent oxidation states. Five electron sublevels, no, that would be PES, that would be photoelectron spectroscopy. Um, the atomic mass is 90, that's not true. The only way the atomic mass of X would be exactly 90 is if we had 100% abundance at 90, but we don't. So then the atomic mass is somewhere between 90 and 92. That is the correct answer because a majority of 50% of it is around 90, but then notice that we have a peak at 91, 92, 94, and a tiny, tiny bit at 96. So it's probably gonna be somewhere between 90 and 92. So elemental composition. So this is topic 1.3. Um, this is actually more lab-based questions. So when we're looking at the composition of uh, pure substances, we're looking at some sort of lab-based question. So this could be looking at determining the empirical formula of a substance. You could do that in either multiple choice or free response. Remember that empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio. And the molecular formula is what the actual formula is. It's some sort of multiple of the empirical. Um, so not only could we, could we be looking at determining the empirical formula, but we could look at how we can test the purity of the substance. And so um, we could look at the purity of the substance by doing some precipitation reactions because precipitation reactions allow us to test the purity of both um, the reactants and the products. 
Um, precipitation reactions could be like gravimetric analysis where you're filtering something out. Um, we could also be looking at the purity of a substance by looking at uh, heating off water. So remember you have multiple heatings of something because the, the more we heat it, the more water is uh, driven off. Uh, we could also be looking at the purity of a substance by comparing the theoretical amount to the actual amount. So be looking at percent error. Theoretical is what is calculated in stoichiometry. So that's what we actually calculate. Actual is what we collect in the lab. So theoretical is the stoic, actual is what you collect in the lab. And then we also could look at determining the molar mass of an unknown. So you guys did a gravimetric analysis lab, I think the second lab that you guys did during the year. And this is calculating the moles of what you know and then working backwards using the balanced equation. So the biggest thing with this topic is this skill. So um, you are able to identify some sort of question based on observation. So an example here is that a student has two samples of sodium chloride, each one from a different source. Assume that the only potential contaminant is KCl. So notice that you would have that contaminant of Cl. Uh, the student runs an experiment to determine the percent by mass of chlorine in each sample from the results. Which of the following questions is most likely to be answered? So we could look at um, purity, wants to know density, uh, what is the source of contaminants, uh, which sample came from a salt mine, and which came from the ocean. So you want to just think, you know, what are questions that don't make sense? So like part D, right? We don't know what came from a salt mine, what came from the ocean. Um, in part C, or in answer choice C, it says that the only potential contaminant is KCL. So we can also eliminate C. So then you're looking at A and B. Um, if you are looking at percent by mass, that helps you determine purity because uh, the sample that has higher purity is the one that, that matches that percent by mass the most. So then uh, from unit one, periodic trends is topic 1.7. Now, uh, you guys didn't really miss questions on periodic trends, but the progress check that we looked at uh, was just multiple choice. So I wanted just to focus on some explanations because you have to be able to explain the trends on the AP exam because it's free response. You cannot just say because it increases as you move down a group. You can't say something like that. To explain, you have to use Coulomb's law. So you have to talk about the attraction between the positively charged protons and the nucleus and the negatively charged valence electrons. So always compare your protons to your valence electrons. The ones that I really want to focus on um, in this video are atomic radius, ionic radius, and ionization energy. I'm not going to talk about electron affinity or electronegativity in this video, but they are still important and you still need to know them. So atomic radius, um, as you look at atomic radius, as you move across a period, so as you move across from lithium to fluorine, the radius actually decreases, so the atom gets smaller, and you'll notice that is in this picture here. Lithium is larger uh, than fluorine. The reason why, so here is your reasoning when it comes to explaining these trends. When you are in the same row, the same period, remember that you have to use effective nuclear charge. So as you move across a period, the effective nuclear charge increases, and so you uh, are increasing the attraction between the protons in the nucleus and the valence electrons, and because it pulls it in more tightly, that results in a smaller radius. As you move down a group or a family, the radius increases. So if you look at this picture here, notice as you go down the halogens, the radius actually gets larger. So even though the nuclear charge gets greater, this is nuclear charge, not effective nuclear charge, just nuclear charge. Um, so essentially how many protons are in the nucleus. As nuclear charge gets greater, so do the number of electrons. And so that's why we look at effective nuclear charge because the effective nuclear charge is essentially the same for all halogens. So as you move down a group, you'll notice that the radius gets larger and larger, and the reason being is because um, the number of protons increase, but so does your principal energy level. So remember to be specific. Principal energy level is your value of N. So the valence electrons are in a higher uh, principal energy level. They're in a higher value of N which is farther from the nucleus, and so the protons don't have as strong of an attraction. All right, so as you move down a group, radius increases because those valence electrons are in a higher principal energy level. When we look at ionic radius, so remember that ionic radius is different for cations and anions. So cations are generally smaller 
than the atom that it came from. So if you look at this, Al3 plus is smaller than Al. And that's because they have lost valence electrons, but they still have the same number of protons in the nucleus. And so there's actually a stronger attractive force from the protons in the nucleus because there are more protons than electrons opposite uh, for anions is that anions are generally larger than the atom that they came from. So if you notice here we have sulfur and we have S2 minus. And so you can have a couple different explanations for anions here. The reason is that they have gained valence electrons but they still have the same number of protons in the nucleus and so there's less of an attractive force because you have fewer protons than electrons. You also could talk about how when electrons are gained there is that repulsive force between the electrons as well. So that works also. Then we look at ionization energy. So remember that ionization energy is the energy that is needed to remove an electron. So the first ionization energy is the energy required to remove the first valence electron. The second ionization energy is the second valence electron and so on. Notice how it's energy required. This is an endothermic process. It's a positive uh, energy value because you have to put energy in. You can look at the atomic radius um, if you're in the same group, or you look at effective nuclear charge if you're in the same row. You have to make sure to talk about the why. You have to use Coulomb's law. Talk about the attraction between the protons and the nucleus and the valence electrons. You always want to talk about attraction with periodic trends. So as you move across a period, so you move across a row, um, it is more difficult to remove an electron, which results in a higher ionization energy. Right? more energy required as you move across a group because the effective nuclear charge increases. And so since the effective nuclear charge increases, there is a stronger attraction between the protons in the nucleus and those valence electrons. So it's more difficult to remove one of the valence electrons. As you move down a group, it is easier to remove an electron. So that's a lower ionization energy as you move down a group because the valence electrons are farther from the nucleus. And so since the valence electrons are in a higher uh, principal energy level, notice how I'm talking about valence electrons, energy levels, things like that. The valence electron is in um, a, a higher value of N and therefore it's not held as tightly by the protons. And so as you move down a group, valence electrons um, are further away, easier to remove. Think about that $20 bill example that I, I used when we talked about periodic trends. Having a $20 bill in my pocket is going to be a lot more difficult to remove because if I'm the nucleus, it's a lot closer to me than if I were to put it in the very back of my classroom. So that's looking at um, a few of the trends. The biggest thing with this is just making sure that you talk about the why. Right? You have to talk about the why to get a lot of these points on free response questions. So finally, how to not miss these points on free response questions. This is part of the write this, not that document. So this is to ensure that you're getting maximum points. So remember when you're talking about a row on the periodic table, you can either use the term row or period. Um, when you're looking at electron configurations, remember that for ions, they come out of the highest value of N. So for example, transition metals, the electrons will come out of the S. Um, make sure that you are referencing the reasons for periodic trends, so effective nuclear charge, Coulomb's law, things like that. You cannot just say, because it increases this way and this way. Uh, make sure that you're talking about effective nuclear charge when you're going across a row. Do not talk about it being stable. Don't talk about it wanting to have a full octet, being stable, things like that. You have to use terms like effective nuclear charge, um, polarizable cloud of electrons, and then something like this, right? Electrons are in higher energy levels and are farther from nucleus, right? You don't want to talk about, you know, more electrons, more energy levels makes it bigger. You have to talk about where the electrons are, where the valence electrons are in relation to the nucleus.